Chapter 3 There wasn't time to think about doors. A man's body was flat on the floor. It lay on the carpet, its polished shoes pointing up at the ceiling, its face to the side and its Burberry coat buttoned and sashed. The showroom itself was of medium size and was showing some paintings and elderly clocks and occasional tables and rickety chairs. Along towards the back was the door to an office. No one was in it, or so I presumed, which left me with Burberry, dead or alive. I gritted my teeth and then sniffed at the carpet that led to the body. I smelled the cigar and the hesitant paws of a terrified cat and the odor of cinnamon mingled with sweat. The sweat and the cinnamon rose from the body. I paused beside it and glanced at its face, which was one of those faces you wouldn't glance twice at unless it was lolling around on your floor. It was pasty and pudgy and, say, about forty with one of those noses that looks like a blob. I walked from its head to the tip of its loafers, a probable distance of five foot and change, and looked down at its fingers, which hadn't been fighting, scratching, poking, or picking its blob, and observed that its watch face had smashed on the carpet. The fall had stopped it at 9.42. At the back of the office a telephone rang. It sounded shrill and a little lonely and died abruptly, leaving its small, disappointed ghost in the silent air. I went back to the body and circled its hairdo, a lousy comb-over job stuck with glue, but with no indication of blows to the noggin. No other bruises, or none I could see, and a second sniffing, a check for gunpowder, blood, or poison, had nothing to say except cinnamon, cinnamon. Hardly a help. I mean, what could have decked him? A stale Danish? I pawed at his cheekbone and found it warm, but it didn't mean much. I reached for his throat and explored for a pulse point. Instead, what I found was a half-buried needle. It sprung from his neck like the thorn from a cactus, a cinnamon thorn, with a yellowish feather attached to its tail. So that was the answer. Someone had drugged him. Someone had lobbed him a sleepy time dart, and as though to confirm it, he snored and groaned. Okay, he was living. I breathed some relief, and then sat on the carpet and sucked a few nails. I could look for the kitten, or look for the cat, or examine his pockets. He snorted again, and I went for his pockets, extracting a fine-looking Cartier wallet and inches of cash, and the gilded initials of S.L.B., a few wallet-sized photos fell out on the floor. An elderly fellow in front of a sign that said, Beaumont Nursery, Wiggum, New York, and the jerk on the carpet with several cats and a goofy expression. I dug for some more. A package of breath mints. A cellular phone. A plastic credit card, notably bent. A traffic ticket from Wiggum, New York, that was dated last evening at 9.53, and indicted a Beaumont, Sebastian L., for exceeding a hundred and running a light. Okay, that was something. I didn't know what, but the motive to shoot him had not been his cash, and had probably not been connected to kittens, which meant that the kitten was probably here. I yelled a soprano-ish, Here, kitty, kitty! I sounded creepy, the kind of voice that you'd tell your children to run from and hide, so I tried a more dignified, Here, little fluffer! Which got me an answer I didn't expect. Little fluffer's been kidnapped. Spike shot his head through the door to the office. 
Come here. Get a load. I looked up at him, squinting. You want to explain how you... Got through the window? Sure. It's a snap. It gives out on the alley. I happen to know that particular alley from La Bernadette. He jerked at the Burberry. What's with the bod? You mean Sleeping Beauty? I said. She's alive. Is it Bridget's landlord? Nope. It's a Beaumont. You think he's the owner? I shrugged. I don't know. I got to the office and gawped at the scene. There were fingers of glass where the window had been busted, and somebody's footprints had blackened the sill. On the floor by a closet was Beaumont's luggage, purple canvas with yellowish straps and a dangling dog tag with SLB. On a desk in the corner, a seven-foot table that held a computer, a lamp and a phone, was a matching carrier, neatly unzipped and disturbingly empty. Kidnapped is right. I leapt to the window and sniffed at the sill. Whoever the cat was who'd been on the carpet had been at the window. The male, about eight, but the rest of his odor was swamped by cigar. Did you check out the carrier? Spike shook his head. And besides, what's the difference? I mean, if he's nabbed, we should know what he smells like. Come on, do it fast. We got onto the table in daredevil leaps, me from the window and Spike from the floor, and we skidded and skated. The surface was slick, and the slippery slick smelled of lemony polish, with essence of Beaumont and stinky cigar. But the pit of the carrier gave something else. Something milky and fishy and slightly acidic, and certainly fluffy and totally scared. Whoever'd been in there was shedding a bucket. The lining was lousy with ebony hairs, and a few had been caught in the teeth of the zipper. Spike looked it over and waggled his head. So somebody yanked little fluff from his carriage and left by the window. He left by the door. Why not the window? Why not the door? He came in by the window. He stood in the office and shot Mr. Beaumont. You mean with a gun? I mean with a dart gun. The angle's perfect. Beaumont was bullseyed and dropped like a stone. The intruder examined him leaving his odor surrounding the body, and walked out the door, where he stunk up the doorway. I see what you mean, Spike thought it over. And, he said brightly, he didn't slam it. The lock didn't catch, which is how Comet opened. A brilliant idea. I suppose if it's brilliant, you thought of it first. I was planning to lie and allow that I hadn't, but destiny spared me. The telephone rang. It rang at my shoulder, which caused me to jump, since it rang like a siren in search of a fire, and it caused Mr. Beaumont to rouse from his funk. Maza, maza, mazaza? he puzzled. Waza? We leapt to the window and out to the icy, dicey dark of the empty night.